Many of you watch our sister program, Public Square, as it airs each month. Now, we want to make sure that the issues that we discuss don't get lost in the public conversation. So this week, host Megan Cambrick sits down to talk opiate addiction and whether leaders have found anything since our show that works to address the crisis. Watching my son fight uh, the addiction um, really caused me to think differently about addiction and, and really chemical dependence. And uh, I, I don't think so much anymore that it's about behavior. He, you know, my son actually understood the disease a lot better than I did. And he literally prepared me and uh, let me know, although he fought like how, you know, to beat the illness, he let me know that he might not make it. How does a parent handle when they find out that their child has cancer or when their child has any other disease? You know, uh, you, you don't want to know or you, you don't want to even think about what the, uh, the most negative outcome might be. And so, you know, you, you try not to think about it, but in the end, he overdosed. Uh, that, that's essentially what happened. Uh, you know, I, I looked for answers, um, tried to figure out ways to help. W what I kept hearing was, um, you have to allow them to hit bottom. You know, you have to allow them to hit bottom. And what, I, I, some addicts die on the way to the bottom, I guess, is the only thing I can, I can come up with, you know. Um, Thank you for joining us today, both of you. Um, now, when we shot uh, Public Square's episode about heroin addiction last year, there were no treatment centers for adolescents in New Mexico. Is that still true? Uh, unfortunately, yes. I mean, it takes, it, you know, it's not something that can be done overnight, so it does take some time. I mean, we've made a lot of headway, and so there's, there's a lot of positive things that have happened since then, um, and we continue to make a lot of headway, but it, it's not something that can happen overnight, unfortunately. And one of the things we talked about with Jennifer and her group is this idea, and I learned this in the legislature and I've learned it as mayor, uh, if we only go for one large treatment center at the very beginning of this equation, it's going to take a long time and resources being stretched and, and all of the work that goes into this, it may prohibit us from doing good work in the meantime. So my recommendation to the group was, let's start smaller. Let's start with mm -hmm. individual treatment centers. Let's get two, three, four uh, uh, kids in a, in a program here, two or three, four here, and start working on this concept on a smaller level, more grassroots level. And then I believe at that point it will blossom into, into what we want it to be eventually. Yeah. So where are we going to start with that? So I think um, based on, on the mayor's recommendation, what we're going to start with is is a transitional living center and something that where young people um, can transition from a treatment center or from um, wherever they were receiving treatment, whether it's an intensive outpatient or a residential program, um, into a living facility where they can actually live long term. Because studies show um, that that opiate addiction isn't something you can cure in a 28-day program, and it's not something that somebody could go into long-term recovery <clears throat> just by going to one residential program. They need long-term care, they need long-term support, and so what we want to build is something where they can get that, something where they can go and live and they can get their education, they can get their GED, they can get some life skills training, they can go to school and get um, job, job trades, um, things like that. We can help them get a job and we can help them build their life and put their life back together. Now I know, I think Jennifer, your group got a $100,000 grant from the city, yes. is that right? Mm -hmm. to, and is this going towards starting these centers? It's going towards the administrative costs to focus all the energy into closing the gap. And so really addressing all the needs on the state, the county, and the city level to really try and figure out what the gaps are and what do we need to do? How can the city help to close those gaps? And so we've had a lot of different discussions about that. Well, I think the funding is important because we've got the energy. We've got advocates. We've got people who've lived through horrible circumstances with, with opioid addiction with their children, Jennifer being one. Uh, we want to make sure that we marshal the energy and marshal the, the activism into a, a channeled effect, an effort to make sure that good things do happen. And I think that's why the administrative dollars are so important, is take everybody that wants to be involved and, and get everybody moving in the same direction. Right. Is there a timeline when one of these might first open? Or 
Well, you know, my timeline was yesterday, so I would okay. I would like to have it as soon as possible. So, you know, there's a lot of pieces, um, a lot of parts to the puzzle that have to be put in place. So really as soon as possible. I mean, I'm hoping early 2013. What do you think, yeah. Mayor? I think so. I think, I think if we start in a reasonable fashion, you know, do the things that we can do today, mm -hmm. I think that it can happen much faster than if we just have, you know, one large you know, concept that's going to take 10 years to put into place. And I think, I think that will help too, because I think it will, it will bring it back to a very organic level and it'll start it, you know, where it needs to be started. Um, and I think from there it'll really take off. Now, is the idea that these would be scattered around the city sort of residential? Um, there might be multiple or locations or there might be one or two locations just depending on, on right now we're working on a location. That's one of the things that we're working on. Now, that can be challenging yeah. as we saw from the latest kerfuffle over UNM trying to open or move its treatment right. center. Right, right, exactly. Do you anticipate? I that think you know, right sometimes you, you get that pushback, sometimes you don't. I think this is a different situation uh, than what UNM had. We're, we're talking about adolescents, we're talking about um, small numbers of, of, of kids. I think it's, it's something that's doable out in the community. Okay. Um, not that, and not that we'd get through with no one being concerned, but I, I don't think it's, it's not the same thing as putting something um, different in your neighborhood. I think, I think this is a, something the neighbors could look at and think, well, these are kids that need a hand. Yeah. And, and, and it's interesting, when you see the, when you see the, the, the addicts um, in this particular circumstance, they come from an enormous cross-section mm -hmm. uh, of society. And so it, it really, yeah, that's why it's so important. And, and that's why I think what Jennifer and her group are doing is, is absolutely critical because if, if we don't get on this early, and it's almost too late to get on it early. In fact, yeah. it is too late to get on it early. Yeah, we're worst in the nation right now. Yeah. Right? Well, but that's been the that's been yeah. the way New Mexico has been for for decades. I mean, we've we've got, but we have high school students in mm -hmm. in, in our high schools in New Mexico that have twice the heroin use of the national average. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think one of the other startling statistics is we have five thousand young men and 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 excuse me, six thousand young men and five thousand young women who needed support last year that couldn't get it. Mm -hmm. So the the urgency is there. And I think that the community... Is that statewide? Mayor? That is statewide, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. And the, the communities, I think, will, will get their arms around this. And, and it, it's one of those things when we started with the education program, people really jumped on uh, with a lot of enthusiasm. And I, I think we'll be able to do that with treatment as well. Yeah. Now, Mary, when in the last show, you spoke very strongly saying you don't just want to be part of one more task force. You said right. the city needs to dovetail efforts with the state. Mm -hmm. Maybe the federal government, now that we have this new national health plan coming into place. What do you think is happening there? Are you working with the state as well? Well, we're, we're absolutely having program? discussions at all levels. And I think one of the things that Jennifer can do with her group is if we can start these, these programs and start them, even if they start on a smaller basis, we then have the ability to walk into someone's office at the state level at, for a legis state legislator uh, at the governor's administration. Um, I'll be in D.C. in January. We'll be able to sit down and talk to people about we're actually doing something. This is the idea about one more task force. If you walk in and ask for funding and say we have a task force and we want some money. That's a lot different discussion than if you walk in and say we have a we've identified a property that we want to buy. Here's what it's going to take to run it on a day-to-day -day basis. Here's the overarching cost for it. Then all of a sudden you've got a real project. And I can tell you as a former legislator and as a mayor, I'm more interested now than just knowing that people are getting together and, and talking. Right. Do you have plans <clears throat> in this coming legislative session to go seek any funds or any uh, bills regarding this? Well, we have we have bills that are related to opiate addiction the the plan that the mayor's talking about where we have an actual plan we have a building picked out and we have a, a budget of what it would cost to run that facility um, we you know right now we're trying to work with we, we don't have any plans to seek legislative dollars but we have we're working with the city the state and the county to try and get all three entities to partner together so that everybody can be part of the solution and as far as private money you know we're trying to seek private donations as well grant money you know really we don't see this as being one particular government run entity we see it being everybody from the community coming together and making sure that it happens. And, and there are opportunities this session. There will okay. be there will be capital outlay this session. And I don't know if there will be a, a, a two junior, which is, you know, a legislative ease for House Bill 2, which is the budget that has a, a junior bill to that for operational costs. Mm -hmm. But there's two components to the centers. There's a, there's a capital cost up front, and there will, there will certainly be dollars available. So my intention is to get with Jennifer, and we will talk to individual legislators once we identify mm -hmm. properties. And if it happens to be in their, in their district, mm -hmm. uh, that's a great opportunity to go up and ask for some, some funding for the capital side. Um, the ongoing um, 
cost of, of maintaining and operating the facilities, that's where I think the private sector can come in and, and really help us with the lift. Mm-hmm. Now, you, speaking of the legislature, some of the issues that came up in the show we did initially with you, for instance, uh, Senator Dee Dee Feldman, who I know is now leaving the legislature, but um, she commented that the legislature had passed a bill urging treatment rather than incarceration that was mm-hmm. vetoed. I don't know if there's going to be another effort to push that. You know, we've been trying. That's, I mean, that is something that we try and raise awareness about all the time because it does make more sense to treat the problem versus just bounce people in and out of jail. And that's what ends up happening. People with addictions, a lot of time they commit the crime because of their addiction. And so if you treat the addiction, plus it's a lot cheaper for taxpayer dollars to treat the addiction than it is to, to keep incarcerating somebody over and over and over again. Um, but we're stuck with the fact that there's very little treatment opportunities for people in the state of New Mexico. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. We have to ramp up the treatment opportunities and, and you know, get um, a, the ability to pay for those medical services and then figure out a way to transition people out of jail and into treatment. Do you know, if, are, is there, will there be any legislation addressing that or are you are you working with anyone on legislation? I've not talked to, to, to Dee Dee about that. Um, yeah. but I, I, or she's, she won't be in the legislature. Right, but I, but, I can, but I can agree with Jennifer. Uh, the upfront part of the equation is much less expensive mm-hmm. than the back side of the equation. Um, and that's why a lot of the work that we're doing also still has to uh, focus on education. It still has to focus on early intervention. Right. Uh, we have, you know, citizens in the city of Albuquerque, we, last year alone, we, we've got... Um, uh, 730,000 pills got turned in to the, the crime lab. You know, on Thursdays from 9 o'clock to, to 4 o'clock, people can take their, you know, clear out your medicine cabinet. If you have pills that you don't use anymore, a lot of those are dangerous, and a lot of those are, are how our youth get, get the drugs in their hands you in the first place. Every Thursday at 2nd and Montano, right at the crime lab, right behind the substation there on the southeast corner, um, from 9 to 4, bring down your, uh, bring down your pills. Uh, Chief Schultz was telling me that last year, um, we had 960 pounds of pills delivered. That's 300 or 730,000 individual pills. Street value of almost a million dollars. Okay. And, and and so so we're educating, you know, through Chris Schuler and through the documentary that we did. And Jennifer uh, played a big part in that, um, along with with her group. We're trying to get kids to understand this 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 is a dangerous drug. Just because somebody got it from their grandparents or their parents' medicine cabinet mm-hmm. doesn't mean. It's not a dangerous drug. And one of the things we hear over and over again from families is if we knew then what we know now, we, 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 you know, if we, there was more education with the student side of this thing, um, maybe that student doesn't take um, the first pill. And these, these pill parties where they're just you know, mm-hmm. grabbing pills and taking them, um, that's, a dangerous, that's a dangerous thing. Well, and also speaking to that, there was another piece of legislation that was uh, trying to limit the number of right. pain relievers that prescribed patients could get, that didn't pass. Right. That was Is a, that also, yeah. are you going to try again? Um, you know, I'm on a, on a National Governors Association task force, and we've been talking about policy changes that can be made, and we've been talking about ways to change things that are, that maybe not necessarily be through the legislature, but ways that we can make changes that will impact um, the, the amount of pills that are on the streets. And that particular bill, um, you know, we've had, I, the bill didn't pass, but the positive thing is we've, we've started a lot of discussions with the medical field since that bill was introduced. And so it really did kickstart the discussion. And I think the doctors and the various entities that can prescribe prescription opiates are beginning to realize um, the impact of having that, that amount of pills being prescribed to individuals and then having them be, again, on the streets, like Mary Berry said. And so the discussions have started. Um, we have had physicians that have limited the amounts that they're prescribing. Um, just on their own, which I think is even better than trying to legislate something. So education. It definitely yeah. got everyone's attention. Yeah. And there was some news coverage mm-hmm. um, uh, about one of the physician who was the most likely mm-hmm. to prescribe in the state of New Mexico, I believe from southern New Mexico. Mm-hmm. And it, I think it really did get, get everyone's attention. And then part of the uh, work that we're doing on an educational standpoint is not just with the youth. It is also with the medical community. Because right. you mentioned when you were on last time that it was important to use your bully pulpit. Yeah. Have you been doing that? I think I'm doing it right now. Okay. <laughs> but no, it's at schools? No, no, it's with we are. medical I, I, community? I, I, I've, been to, I've been to a number of high schools when we have the uh, student assemblies, which, mm-hmm. by the way, uh, when you have a principal of a high school mm-hmm. who's willing to pull the entire student assembly together to have this discussion, right. um, that's, uh, 
kudos to them. Right. And we have a number of principals. Uh, Principal La Cueva was the first, I believe, mm -hmm. to do it. And so uh, now we've had other, other schools follow suit. And that's a very interesting thing when you go there. And I say a few words as a mayor, but I really try to speak as a dad more than a mayor when I go to that. But it's a very powerful thing. And I know that we've had uh, students come up after those presentations mm -hmm. and talk to people and say, I need right. some help today. Right. And so what it, can you it, tell them when they say that? Like, look, I mean, what, what's their option when they come up and say, I need help now? Well, well you, you channel them. You, you yeah. get them to the services. There are services available. There aren't enough. And I think we can all agree on that. But there are services available. And if people know someone, and I, you know, I've got several friends um, who are personally going through this right now, in addition mm -hmm. to Jennifer, uh, this is this is not an uncommon thing. So if people uh, need some help. You know, there are resources available. If if you just want to call City Hall, call call the mayor's office. We'll get you in touch with the right people. Yeah. So if you call the mayor's office or you call three one one, you can get. Just call, call the mayor's office, 768-3000. Okay. Uh, tell them you saw the mayor on this program and that you, you know someone that needs a hand. Um, we don't provide the services through the mayor's office, but we'll, we'll, we'll be a bridge and a conduit for people to get the help that they need. And they can find, because I know that's an ongoing right. issue, right? right? The young people we had on the show talked about. And, that, yeah. and that's a frustration, for yeah. sure. There's not enough. There's no right. question. There, there's not enough, and there are, there are services available. It's just tough to find those services, and it's tough to, to link all those services together so that you're not just, you know, you have these disparate services that people are trying to, to fumble through on their own. But um, the mayor's right, we're trying to, right now, as a matter of fact, create a substance abuse hotline so that people could call the substance abuse hotline and actually not only talk to someone um, about the problem that they're having, having, whether it's their family member or themselves, but also get access to services so they can help channel them to the right appropriate services, um, whether they're in state, out of state, or, or you know, depending on their medical coverage, things like that. So we're trying to, to create and work with the, the city of Albuquerque to create some kind of substance abuse hotline as well. Is there any anticipation the federal health care law will make this easier for people to find services, pay for them? You know, I, I haven't read the whole thing myself, but I have heard that there are um, provisions in that bill that talk about substance abuse and addiction being treated more as a disease, which is what it is, mm -hmm. versus a, um, a social issue or, or someone's moral failure, um, which is the problem right now. A lot of insurance companies, um, you know, insurance companies unfortunately dictate treatment in a lot of ways because they deny treatment based on the fact that they think it's a moral failure on someone's part and that they should just stop using drugs. Well, in most cases, it's just not that easy. And, and it does become a brain disease and they need to treat it as such. And, and we live in a community and other communities are, are the same as Albuquerque. When our largest uh, treatment center for mental illness is the county jail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when our largest treatment center for drug addiction is the county jail, yeah. um, that's a failure. Yeah. And we need to do better. And yeah. so the question is, how can we do that in a smart way? And I think it involves, it involves so many people. But I think what, what Jennifer's doing through her advocacy and her group is we're actually, like I said earlier, we're channeling that. Mm -hmm. We're starting to put the resources and the energy where it mm -hmm. needs to be to make very real differences on the ground. And then we can watch that grow over time. But right. you have to start somewhere. And, right. and, and, and we're kind of at that point now where we're just we're just beginning the process yeah and we're putting the pieces together i just one more question for y'all so one of the things that came up of course the narcan program in new mexico mm -hmm. has been pretty um, successful in preventing overdoses but apparently one of the young people on the show pointed out that you can't access narcan if you're under 18 so you can't care, have that with you if you're overdosing or a friend's overdosing, is that still true? Do you think that should change? Um, I, I don't know that you can't access Narcan. I know that needle exchange, you have to be over 18 in order to get clean needles, and so that's been an issue, and that's been a bill that we've um, tried to address numerous times in the legislature. Um, and needle exchange, you know, it's kind of like the whole birth control thing. If you give somebody clean needles, does that mean they're going to use drugs? And the answer to that is no. I mean, it just assume, it just makes it safe so that they are going to use drugs regardless, and it just gives them a safe environment to do so, so that they're not exchanging needles with other people. Um, Narcan is widely available. Um, I, I don't know exactly if it's not available to people under 18. I've never specifically heard that. But um, anybody can get Narcan for free. We are one of the few states in the country that provide Narcan free of charge. And it's a great program, and it is, um, it, is they, it definitely saves lives. I mean, there's no doubt in my mind that it saves it lives. Helped. It's like an EpiPen of someone's going to yeah. inflict a shock. Yeah, opiates are one of the very few um, substances where you can reverse the signs of an overdose using um, this drug called Narcan. And it's administered through the nose. It's a, it's a nasal spray. Mm. And it it's brought people back to life. I mean, it's not, it doesn't always work. It's not 100%. It's not a foolproof 
um, lifesaver, but it is definitely effective when used appropriately. Yeah, I remember one of the young women on the show who had been an addict said that specifically, and like they yeah. couldn't access it. I, th I, think, 18, I, think, I think the voices that really cut through on this discussion are the youth. Yeah. They're, they're, the, they're the kids who, who have become addicted and who have been through the process and, and the voices of the parents. Mm -hmm. um, my role as a mayor is to work to try to work with the groups to try to make sure that we're doing all the things that we need to do. I think we've made huge strides in the educational aspect of this in the last year. I think we're making big differences in that and that's the less expensive part of the equation. And I think working with Jennifer and her group now to start with smaller treatment type centers, moving up to the kind of treatment centers that we need over time, I think we're on the right road. We've got a long way to go mm -hmm. and it's a very serious issue, but uh, I, I'm very encouraged by what I'm seeing in the community uh, on all parts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you both for coming back to talk with us about oh, thank this you for having us. I appreciate thank you. Our next Public Square program on child abuse prevention airs next Thursday evening, December 27th at 7 o'clock, right here on New Mexico PBS.